uh, we went and it was awesome and I had a fun time and I think my knees were thanking me that I dropped 30 pounds and the boys were awesome and then Zion even went on some blue runs with my buddy who's been skiing for years and he's like dad I'm gonna be a ski bum he's my younger guy with the white dreads the really long dreads and uh I apologized. I said, I'm sorry, I didn't give you this opportunity sooner <laughs> to be a ski bum. If he was in California, I'm sure Zion would grow up to be a surf bum. This is really just the natural progression. And uh, I opened up the door. So there you go. And then yesterday, wow, yesterday was, uh, we celebrated Easter here um, at our house. But uh, look at that. Woo! Brand new Black Series. I got a new Boba Fett yesterday. That's right. Pew, 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 pew. What am I doing? Yeah, that's that's right. That's what I wanted. Got it. Go Easter Bunny. <laughs> uh, we have four acres. We still do like an egg hunt with the boys. Um, so, you know, we celebrate Easter in more of like the rabbit and dyed eggs kind of way. Uh, but when you have four acres to hide candy and eggs and stuff on, it is so much fun. I kept them working. They're out there for like three hours. Seriously, they did the first round and I'm like, nope, you're missing all sorts of eggs. And then they went back and then we do like a scrambled word hunt um, where I put one of the clues in the porta potty because I'm dad. And uh, anyway, it was hilarious and we had a good time and I ran them around and uh, skiing was totally fun. So I hope you had a great weekend uh, and that you were safe and careful and all that. Um, I just released um, the, uh, so I was too busy, sorry about that skiing uh, for once in forever to do a study guide right after class. I'll put that up. I got that together. Um, it should be easier because it's not over three chapters. It's just over two chapters. We've been talking a lot about stratification and a lot about race. I thought Friday's conversation was awesome. I do appreciate everybody for joining in on that. And yeah, just uh, just a great conversation, not only about Jane Elliott, but about race in general. So I'm going to keep going with chapter nine. I just posted that link. Um, sometimes, maybe one other time a semester, two other times a semester that we've had like really great, but sort of meaningful or deep or personal conversations. So that is unlisted, but you have the link now in announcements. Just do that out of, you know, respect to everybody involved in the class. And um, so if you haven't seen that, that is up now. Thank you for so many people joining. Uh, I think Friday we had like, you know, 69 people here or something like that. We are not having class Friday. The exam opens up on Thursday. It's open for like two days basically. And then maybe till noon on Saturday uh, over the chapter on stratification and race. So no class this Friday. Thanks for participating. You didn't lose points if you weren't here, but you know, it's just really important. Um, <clears throat> not only, uh, I don't not only feel that way, but obviously, like I said, every chapter or every time that we talk about race, there's something going on in the world. Um, we could spend some time maybe in a little bit as I look at this talking about uh, what's going on in Georgia with sort of restricting voter access. You know, if something happens and you hear the term Jim Crow uh, used a lot, like I haven't heard that term used as much in the last five days as I have in a long, long time. So maybe we could look at that if we still have time. I think it's there's an important race component uh, to that and a lot of other components um, and now some, um, you know, some corporations that are popping out, I think major league baseball said, we're not going to have the all-star game here. And, uh, so anyway, we'll talk about that in, in regards to race. If we have some time, which I think we probably should, we'll meet today. We'll meet Wednesday. Are there any questions? The food matters papers coming up, um, for my other classes, I think in Boulder, uh, their big paper assignments were due are due today. Yours, because I think you started maybe a week later, are due next week. Um, so, you know, just a reminder to get on top of that. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not getting a ton of emails about topics for section three or anything like that, or people needing a lot of help. Can we check with our TA to see if you're going in the right direction? I think they welcome it. Yeah, we all welcome that. Absolutely. Um, and it says for the sixth question, the content assignment, do we need citation? Sounds like we don't. Anything that asks you your opinion still needs to be connected 
to material that we've learned from the text or important, like, you know, make the connection, make the solid connection to the source, um, even if it asks for opinion, whatever that might be. Um, Cause your own personal insight, I hope you're adding these to lots um, because it's sociology. That being said, um, yeah, do we have to, you don't have to check with me uh, or any of us about your topic. But I feel like sometimes people jump into things and they didn't go to class or they weren't there in the day I was explaining the paper and they do obesity. And I've like said, you know, stay away from that. Stay away from eating disorders. Stay away from things that people have written dozens of books on. Pick something more specific, you know, that you've really filtered through and it's as specific as you can that interests you. So you don't have to check in with us about your topics. But if you want to know if you're in the right direction, I get paid for that. I actually do. I do. I know. So I'm. I'm not only recommending it, I'm contractually obligated even probably, <laughs> or at least I tell you I am, so I will. Um, I wouldn't do any of this just for a paycheck or because I had to. Me drinking out of a jelly glass or an old salt container, that's because I have to, because the boys don't do any dishes. <laughs> but it's still, there was one last thing to put water in. Um, can we do uh, two or three topics within it? I think it would be difficult in two pages to do two or three topics unless they completely overlap um, and inner and inner sort of lock and lap and mesh and all that synergy, uh, whatever this, whatever that is. So ask us if you have any questions. Yeah, we're a week about a week out or exactly a week out on that. If this is the fifth. Um, all right, I think we're good. I'm gonna peek out the window because I let the chickens out for a couple hours. We've been letting them out for a couple hours midday got the dogs out there watching them, but every once in a while, if you see me give a glance, just to make sure that there's no mass murder taking a place on my farm while I'm teaching class, because <laughs> that's a distinct possibility. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I did not open up any top hat questions this morning, I don't think. Let me find uh, my PowerPoint and then I'll not this one. Please stop doing that. Uh, okay, and also if there's any questions, you know, during the class period, just ask, um, and I'll see if I can help you. Okay. Uh, all right, so discrimination, we chatted a little bit, um, and I'm not sure if I talked about, did I, did I get to this? Yeah, I think I did. Uh, did I get to this one? Discrimination, I don't think so. I don't think so. We're gonna we're gonna start here though. I do believe I talked a little bit about this um, institutionalized discrimination. I'll get back to that. Uh, and, but but built. In, I'm gonna get back to it again. But I did mention here discrimination and bias built into the operation of society's institutions. I mean, people would be like, "How can that be?" But that's what profiling is. Profiling is just having built in certain practices and behaviors into institutions. Uh, legal system, the justice system, employment, banking, you name it, right? So discrimination, unequal treatment of individuals on the basis of their membership in a group, usually the non-dominant group. Um, it could be intentional or unintentional, and it is meant to deny equal opportunities, and it certainly blocks access to valued resources. Now, I think that we get the idea that we're sort of in competition in a way with, with folks in this society, in this country, in this culture, in the school for valuable resources, scholarships, time, you know, classes, access, all of it matters. Um, and then of course we did the, the institutionalized but individual discrimination, overt and intentional unequal treatment, uh, often based on prejudicial beliefs. Um, we know that uh, applicants are, I believe half is likely uh, to have an application accepted if they have a black sounding name. Um, I know it's vague, but if your name sounds diverse, and I, again, I've, I've got a friend who has experienced this on many levels, um, and she's from India, and, and it's just, you know, super frustrating. But if that name is the piece, then what do you do? If we know that that is the case, right? Same with whether that might be drugs and, 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 and or applications, denying applications because of race, then how do we deal with it, right? What are some uh, solutions to that? And I think we did a good job last week proposing potential solutions. So again, institutionalized discrimination, discrimination enshrined in law, 
public policy um, or common practice, right? Embedded in routine operations of major social institutions, uh, present in businesses, schools, hospitals, and government. Um, and of course, discrimination initially institutionalized in the constitution. Um, redlining, subprime lending, the war on drugs, and certainly this powerful influence uh, and this wealth gap between people of color and people of European descent. Um, but it seems routine and oftentimes it is discriminatory. Uh, and I know um, we're not so much talking about it now, but I, I saw it in the news the other day again about taking down monuments. And I know some people feel like it's rewriting history. Um, you know, we've also have these figures in schools named after folks who are not only extremely racist, but traitors to this Republic. Um, you know, do they do that in Germany? Why not? What does that look like? Why do we celebrate those people? How is that, um, you know, time for that to end and why, and how does decide, how does society determine that? Right. I mean, these statues have stood for decades and decades and decades and decades um, what's going on right now that we're questioning these things and that these things are changing. Um, and I remember when, I don't know if we talked about this, but I remember when Storm came home and they had just gone up to CSU Mountain Campus for their little eco week, right? And I said, how was Pingree? And he said, that's CSU Mountain Campus, dad. And I said, well, I kind of like the name Pingree. And he said, yeah, well, Pingree was a guy that offered haircuts in exchange for Native American scalps. And I was like, well, that, okay, CSU Mountain Campus it is. And I had a few other choice words for that individual as well. Um, that's not cancel culture. That's behavior that we have determined as reprehensible. And so you're done. We're done celebrating you and your namesake because it doesn't stand for anything that, you know, that people uh, haven't collectively agreed isn't completely awful. So sort of an example of that kind of thing as, as that cancel culture notion, race, politics, and so much of this get, um, get intertwined. So we get this sort of cyclical piece, right? Prejudice and discrimination begin as these ethnocentric attitudes, ethnocentrism, the belief that your culture is superior. We have Eurocentric views as well as ethnocentric views that would be you know, supporting the views of, of Europeans or finding those views as more important. And historically, you know, historically, it could be completely false. The way that people have done maps for so long is very Eurocentric, right? Um, adjusting the sizes of nations to look larger, to be in the center, other nations to be smaller. And, and so again, those maps weren't canceled they're just wrong. They're not accurate. And so we replace them with something, hopefully, and of course not in a lot of places yet, but hopefully with something that is much more accurate. Do we know how to draw maps with the continents, the correct sizes? You bet we do. Is racism so pervasive that it even gets into that area? Absolutely. Um, so that's an example of, of, I guess, a very collective and institutionalized piece, um, you know, so groups are placed in a situation where they're socially disadvantaged and labeled. A group situation then from a functionalist perspective uh, particularly is explained as a result of innate inferiority rather than looking or examining or trying to change the social structure. And then it happens again, right? Um, and so we've already looked at all sorts of ideas uh, for dismantling racism and prejudice and discrimination. But again, we have to understand that it's not just in a circle, it's in a circle downhill with inertia, right? It's in a circle with historical inertia in times and places and not sort of happening, like I've said before, in a vacuum. So technical definition of a prejudice, belief about an individual or group that is not subject to change on the basis of evidence, right? And stereotyping, generalizing a set of characteristics to all members of a group, that's why I have a picture here of white men can't jump from the movie uh, or a picture from the movie white men can't jump. And look, these always weren't the cases, the construction of race, we've already talked about it coming out of Europe um, in the 18th century. Look, after Europeans discover 
that there's a massive economic value to exploiting minority folks around the globe for their labor and for natural resources, it's on. Um, and, and that power and, and access to those resources and the ability to continually do that without sort of the globe looking at that as a moral or humanitarian sort of piece for so long, um, <clears throat> that's you know designed to do just that. So we have to understand that uh, positive stereotypes are still racist just because it's like, hey, that's a good stereotype. That means that you're very athletically gifted. Um, you know, still a racist piece, even if you're trying to put some type of positive spin on it. If it's a prejudice, right? A belief that you're just not gonna change even when the evidence is clearly there. Um, and, and that overgeneralizing of characteristics to all members uh, in an entire or in an entire group or in a group that are members of a group. So, um, you know, know the difference. And okay, so what are some of the real impacts of racism, prejudice, and discrimination? Um, and I would say that these outcomes are across the board. These are social outcomes. These are health outcomes. These are educational disadvantages. These are wealth disadvantages. These are ownership disadvantages, um, employment disadvantages, uh, um, social justice or justice system disadvantages. So we look at a, at a lot of these things, right? We can look at a much higher rate of negative birth outcomes. Uh, Black women 60% more likely to experience premature birth. 230% uh, more for uh, black babies or African-American children to die before the age of one. Sorry, I gotta get the door real quick. Nope, you stand out there. Uh, Huckle the farm dog doesn't wanna do his job, but he's got to, it's nice out. Um, black women more than two times likely to have low weight infants than whites or Latinas. And this comes back to a lot of things, uh, availability of healthcare, education, birthing resources, you name it. Um, social epidemiology studies communities and their social statuses, practices and problems to understand patterns of health and disease. I'm currently teaching an entire class on this um, at CU Boulder, health inequalities or the sociology of health inequalities. And although socioeconomic status hands out to be the number one indicator. Race is very close behind it when we're talking about, you know, what are these things that impact um, these patterns of health and disease, particularly for communities of color. Um, and then we've got this here again, racial and ethnic groups in the United States. Um, all right, so we kind of, and of course, like I said, this is just the birthing piece is just one piece of the consequences. You could look at, um, like I said, just life expectancy, hypertension, availability of jobs and the dangers that those particular jobs present. Anyway, on and on. Um, but we are a multi-ethnic, multi-racial and increasingly diverse society. Non-whites, this is several years ago, make up 38% of the US population. In less than 20 years, these folks are gonna be the majority. And this isn't something that like, white supremacy can do anything about. Uh, it's, it's nothing that nationalism or anything like that, there's no way to address this, nor should there be. Um, we know that this is the direction that it's heading. It's a lot like a lot of things, you know, um, I'm not telling people to eat less meat, but water is a finite resource. That's a reality. This is a future reality that we can understand with data now. Um, majority of the babies under two years old were non-white in 2010. <clears throat> and by 2050, a fifth of the United States population um, will be immigrants. So at a certain point, the United States has to deal with it. We have to learn how to understand diversity, how to celebrate diversity, and particularly how to dismantle the structures in our society that, um, that, that increase uh, that um, disenfranchisement, that increase that gap, uh, and that don't, don't celebrate that. All right, so let me see here identify okay um oh, we did that do you have unearned privilege so most people identifying in here that they did sorry i just wanted to check back at that i do i do think that we looked at that though um and again we look at this not because uh 
anybody needs to feel guilty about privilege, but because unearned privileges exist. All right, so um, I've got a lot here. This is really wordy. I'm crammed as much in without pictures to as many slides as I could. It's not entertaining. I don't expect you to write it all down, um, but write down what stands out to you and then you have access to these slides so that you can look at or, you know, or print it out later. But I've worked for a long time, I guess the last 25 or 30 years. And the goal has been to reduce prejudice and discrimination. Uh, worked uh, with very awesome, powerful, um, woman Vivian Jenkins Nelson, although I'm not sure what's uh, what she's doing these days at Interrace at Augsburg College for a while. I've gone into police departments and school districts and colleges um, and have done small group things and you you name it, spoken at places and have gone into a lot of a lot of trainings and done nothing but listen. So what we have to know when we're talking about reducing prejudice is that there are a lot of ways, right? We have to look at this sociologically. There's a lot of different prejudices and there are a lot of different ways that people have been socialized, right? So the thing that we have to understand is you might be really excited about dismantling racism or prejudice. I am really excited about uh, dismantling racism. Prejudice. I'm excited about crushing white supremacy, um, but the ways in which we do so have to make sense and they don't work for everybody. So that's one thing that we have to understand. Like I mentioned on Friday, the approach for Jane Elliott isn't for everybody. And by all means, um, it's a good way to shut a certain amount of people down within seconds. Um, and for other people, it has been the catalyst that has changed their lives. And then of course, the lives of the people that they've interacted with because it's been a great learning tool. So approaches that work best vary from individual to individual, depending on the type of prejudice and its main cause. Now, you know a little bit about, whether it's your parents or your guardians or your friends, you know a little bit about those people. You also know a little bit about how to present an idea that you want them to find favorable, right? and you change it. It's likely different for your mom than it is for your dad, than it is for your uncle, than it is for your grandpa, than it is for one of your best friends. So that's um, <clears throat> what we have to keep in mind here, right? And it, when prejudice serves to justify or support this discriminatory behavior, I mean, really attempts to change it might not be impactful at all, you know? Um, each approach must be geared to the individual situation um, and the ways that we approach reducing prejudice all share the same sort of core piece or assumption, okay? And that is that all prejudice, although prejudice, and I've said this many times in this class, and I've said it many times in this chapter, although prejudice does, forget may, serve some important individual or social functions, it involves invalid or irrational thinking Right? It involves a lot of falsehoods and is therefore vulnerable to attack, okay? This is perhaps one of the most important things that we can keep in mind, right? Um, it's not necessarily fair. We know it's built on a foundation of invalid and irrational thinking and a foundation of lies. And so therefore, it can be changed. It can be attacked. Racism, prejudice, and discrimination are vulnerable. And, you know, I mean, think about this. If that discrimination all stood on a body of work and research and, and not lies, it would be much different. Um, so I think that that's really important, you know, for us to think of. I have here, how would you, how have you dismantled prejudice? Let's Let's keep this one in mind, because I think that there's a lot of different ways that we, we talked about how would you like, like in, in a, you know, possible sense, like what would you do to dismantle your own, your own um, privilege? How might we do this? Redistribute wealth. But have you dismantled prejudice? Have you made an impact? Where was it? Was it something simple like a family reunion and grandpa told a racist joke and some people laughed uncomfortably and you stepped in and said, nope, that's just not, we're not doing that here in this time and place. That's not funny. 
in fact, it's racist. Or, um, you know, have you done something else? So I guess keep this in mind um, as we're talking more about this uh, today and Wednesday. And then also I have here compassion, understanding, and education. Look, we have to look at all of these issues this semester. I, again, I sound like a broken record. How many times have I said this to you? We got to look at things from multiple perspectives, right? And if I'm going to be as value neutral or as unbiased as I can be, that's going to be really hard. If you would pick the topic that makes me most upset or I think is the worst, I'm going to go right for white supremacy, right? I'm going to say that it's going to be really hard for me to understand any of that actual trash and, and falsehood that comes from those perspectives. That being said, if I want to know how to dismantle it, if I want to know how to remove it, I'm going to have to try and cultivate some compassion. I'm going to have to cultivate some understanding, and I'm going to have to learn about those people. And it's, is it Daryl Davis? And I've mentioned him before. Uh, you could probably find some great videos out there. But the African-American guy that befriended, musician from Chicago, that befriended Ku Klux Klan members and did his way of, of getting them to quit. He's had got over like 200 people that were real lifetime type members of white supremacist organizations to quit. And he didn't do it by trying to sell them on it. He didn't do it in a lot of the ways he did it by sitting down and having a beer with them, by inviting them to his shows, by talking to them like a normal human being, and by proving to them through intergroup contact that all that they knew about brown folks was a lie. But to do that, this individual had to exercise a great deal of compassion, understanding, and education, right? Um, maybe even past what we even think that we can accomplish so that he would understand that so that he could do that, sit down with those people and say, nope, what you've been told isn't true and get them to listen, which of course is the other thing that I've said here, which is a, the really difficult part. Um, okay, so persuasive communications. So maybe just write down this first piece here, right? And of course, there's a bit of a gray area with persuasive communications. I have here any communication that's specifically intended to influence attitudes, beliefs, or behavior, a speech, a movie, a book. I mean, this course is designed to impart information to you, so it's not really an example of that, but it is an example of that in a way, right? I mean, when I speak about dismantling racism or prejudice, I'm speaking persuasively about it, but when we're talking specifically about race relations, maybe somebody made a really good movie that made a huge impact on somebody. Maybe somebody went to a lecture at the school. Sorry, hearing a dog bark. And they made a, a really huge impact. Um, so, so these are, right, the, the sort of how would that succeed? It's got to be paid attention to. Okay, the, the people that are getting that message have to pay attention to it, right? Um, and look, it, it, it's hard sometimes to rope people in or get them to listen to that or, or be persuaded because, I mean, we're also, we learn to ignore a lot of that, right? <laughs> I mean, YouTube is a perfect example. They're giving me five seconds and I've already clicked out. I've already like shut off in my brain after half of a second. Because I just know it's an advertisement. I don't care. I've already decided. Whatever. The message must be understood. And if it's really going to reduce prejudice with persuasive communications, it has to be understood that that's what's going on. Like, it's not subtle. Like, you're trying to trick people. This is what's happening. Okay? You're here because I'm trying to teach you about this and reducing these prejudicial beliefs. Um, okay. Somebody's got to retain it. It's got to be retained and internalized. And also, it's got to be a positive experience. It has to be seen as presenting a good idea. Now, that being said, what are the chances? That's, that maybe this is really a good approach for people who are like mildly prejudiced. You know, they've heard some stuff from their parents but they think their parents are full of it about a lot of other things too. So maybe, right? But if you look at this list, 
I mean, this is where I just don't even have time sometimes. Like, really? Like, to change somebody's attitude, it's got to be all of these things. It sounds like an awful lot of hand-holding. Well, you've also got to be really tactful how you get your point across. So what's the source of the communication? I was talking last week about people like Jane Elliott or Tim Wise. You know, they get a lot of speaking gigs. They get a lot of speaking gigs as white folks about discrimination and prejudice. But to a lot of people who are very prejudiced, they're not going to listen to a, an African-American woman or to a Latino man, a person of color. They're just not gonna. They've been trained not to and they won't. So the source of the communication is important. It doesn't always have to be a person of European descent. Sometimes that's important depending on the amount of racism. The content of the message, the process which, which it's presented, um, and all these other things. The characteristic of the audience receiving the message. This is why really smart comedy can absolutely make people less prejudiced. Because, and Dave Chappelle knows this. Dave Chappelle knows that a large portion of his audience is white. He knows that a large portion of his audience is unequipped and uncomfortable to talk about race. And so I guess I just use Dave as an example, but so many times that is a really great example. Well, how can all these conditions be met, Jason? Well, they can at times and in really smart ways, but you can't, deprogramming racism is a really heady thing. It's not like a, a oh, I'm just gonna, you know, throw it out there and hope it sticks, right? All right, so observations. People expose themselves to messages that they're consistent with what they already believe, right? I believe this, so I'm watching that news channel. You know, because that's the news channel that reflects my beliefs. I'm comfortable watching it. It gives me that constant, this is what's going on that makes me feel good. So that's how you know that you've got to get those messages out there. They've got to, you know, people pay better attention to messages that support these pre-existing viewpoints. And they retain them longer. So find common ground, right? Find something that somebody agrees with. And then say, isn't that ridiculous? You know, it, it, here's how this is. You don't like that either. Now, how ridiculous is that? And then, you know, so, and I think of um, somebody that I talk to quite often in, in, uh, in this way is a guy who helps me on the farm. His name is Mike. He taught me everything about the farm, how to fix my tractor, you name it. He listens to a lot of extreme right wing talk radio stuff that I think is really quite prejudiced, quite racist. But we managed to have some amazing conversations. And there's so much middle ground. And there's so much that as long as I explain it in a way that reflects reality and isn't like too intense, that's sort of like, this is gravity. And here's how you know gravity works. Then it has been very, very successful. Um, because that's, you know, you got to expose people to messages that they're used to or, or willing to internalize. And so you can consistently or simultaneously give them a message that is consistent to what they believe, but is also anti-prejudice or racist. Um, you know, most likely to accept anti-prejudice communication tend to be those who are the least prejudiced. So of course, of course, right? Um, that's not where a lot of the work needs to be done. That doesn't mean that there aren't a whole bunch of people that self-label as liberals that wanna pat themselves on the back for being super open-minded and not racist, and, and they are, right? I mean, quite clearly, not every Democrat is on board with the BLM movement and not every Republican hates people of color. This is, those are extremes. So stay away from those extremes when we're trying to get people to deprogram from these attitudes. And of course, the personality of the person receiving the message is important. Some personalities, boy, oh boy, I don't know. It's just not really going to be very possible. But that's where something like Daryl Davis, who sits down with the Grand Wizard or whatever silly names they give themselves, the Grand Wizard of the KKK, and gets people like that to fold their hand. You know, um, it's possible, right? All right. Um, prejudice people. Okay. Um, so, Prejudiced people often do not think of themselves as prejudiced, and thus the messages are applicable to somebody else, right? I'm not prejudiced. I've got black friends. Yikes. 
All right. We know that that's not a good lead off for a non for a non prejudice uh, statement. So, but we can also see how people that are prejudiced would think of themselves as not. That's just work numbers. That's just this. That's just that. That's well, you know, as prejudice become more subtle. And as those things become more normalized, I would say a lot of prejudice has become normalized over the past 10 years, a lot of it. Um, and so the more subtle it becomes, the more rationalization, the rationalization that people have gets easier and easier, right? Um, attitudes tend to be resistant to change even if they're vulnerable to forced attempts. I mean, people are resistant. I am who I am. I believe what I believe, again, we hope that people retain the ability to continuously learn, but not necessarily, right? Um, this approach works best as a way of reinforcing open-mindedness, reducing prejudices in people who are mildly prejudiced, right? This persuasive communications, like I said in the source, highly important. Does it have prestige? Does it have credibility? I mean, even attractiveness. When you're getting a persuasive speech as a human being, we consider all of these things, the power, and the influence of the person who's giving the message. This could be a very prejudiced message, but because of the perceived credibility of the person or the status or how much power they have, people could say, well, see, that's a message that's quite clearly not prejudiced, even if it very much is. Um, so obviously I have sources highly important, the credibility of the source. You know, Jane Elliott is seen as an expert. Is she seen as trustworthy? Um, you know, what's it like receiving messages from multiple sources? Because that always increases the impact, right? Hearing it multiple times. Look at the masking thing. I mean, deny, 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 fine, put one on, but I'm not going to. And then suddenly you get new people in the White House and it's in commercials and it's on TV and there's all sorts of messaging coming. Like all of a sudden the normalization of it is happening, right? So, I mean, it's just something here. It, there, there, we're not just trying to deprogram racism with persuasive uh, communication. We're trying to get people to do a lot of things. Uh, and it's sometimes things that they really need to do for their own safety. But again, we've been trained to resist messages, even if that's a message of safety or whatever that might be, a unique situation like a pandemic or something like that. All right, so persuasive communication, education. This is the one that we hear all the time, right? Education, education, education. What should we do about that? Education. What's the solution to this? Education. Um, but we need to be more specific, okay? Uh, education doesn't really attempt to change people's attitudes in that it's not persuasive um, or it's not designed to be as persuasive. It's objective. Here's the information. Now you learned it. Now that you know that this information is true or false, what do you do with it? <laughs> Sorry, I seem nervous. It's just because we haven't had the chickens out a lot and there's been a lot of foxes. So let's focus that education on intergroup relations, right? Because that education does change people's minds because it hangs out in their head. You know, it's a mix of both usually, obviously. But it's most effective education is in reducing prejudice when it minimizes the stress of admitting previous error. You know, you're going to stand above somebody and be like, no, you can't handle the truth. I mean, you might be passionate, but that person's likely not going to just abandon everything and it'd be like, okay, I completely admit that the way I've been living for 50 years is wrong. You got me. <laughs> like, that just doesn't happen very often. So we've got to understand it's not, and that's the thing that I'm always talking about. It's not the guilt thing. It is not the guilt thing. It's the let people take responsibility thing. That's what helps, right? I mean, if you're going to educate people, try not to make them feel defensive or threaten their egos. Why do you think I start this class off with, it's not about guilt, it's about responsibility. Why do you think I start the class off in this chapter off with the same thing over and over? Because I know how fragile our egos are as human beings, okay? Mine at 47, yours at 18, grandpa's at 100. I don't know. They are. So 
We want to make people feel like they're participating and learning like new ideas themselves. Isn't this great though? It's like, like people think about doing this with kids, you know, Ooh, we can get, you know, reverse psychology. Look, we can do this with adults, you know, make them feel like they're learning something, make them feel like they're participating and learning something new. And that new thing is the right thing. It's not you that was right. It's them. And they were smart enough to realize that. And if we are talking about education, I don't have to put smart enough in quotes. People realize it. They learn they were wrong. I was wrong. I thought this about all people of color. And here's how I figured out that that's not the truth. And it was this piece that I saw and I'm thinking about it for a while. And then I talked to somebody else about it and I realized I learned something new. I'll pat myself on the back. <laughs> and you know what? I'm always willing to pat somebody on the back if they are learning something that's like how not to be prejudiced, how not to carry on that stuff that's just like over and over and over again. I mean, why do we do it? When I talk about inertia, I mean just freaking inertia. I was about to buy a gas powered chainsaw last week. Why? Because they only make gas-powered chainsaws? No, because I was used to it. Because my dad had one. Because somebody told me that's how you cut a damn tree down. I uh, decided to think for myself, read a couple articles, got an education, bought an electric chainsaw, saw it work in person, and was like, oh, <laughs> you know, like education. You think I'm giving my friend credit for telling me that he used a chainsaw that was electric last week? Nope, I'm patting myself on the back. And that's fine if it leads to something better, right? So education. Teachers make an important difference. Yes, we do. <laughs> ah, that's not for me. That's for all the other teachers, all the people that are working hard out there. I love them. Uh, teachers are sometimes prejudiced. Look, I don't like old drivers. Yeah, I'm prejudiced. That's just the reality. There's some old drivers out there that are way better than me, but I'm, I'm, but I'm getting offended at them. Okay, I hope that most teachers are as prejudice free as possible. That's my hope. You know, with Jane Elliott, it's like, you know, the thing that we didn't talk about, I don't think last week was, they asked her, would you like everybody to do this? What was her answer? I'll stop. I'll wait because I've been chip, chip, beep, beep, beep. What was her answer? Anybody? Anybody remember? She said she wanted like teachers to do it, but she didn't know if everyone should do it because she said it's a very like big concept and sometimes people won't understand, which I think we kind of saw with some of the adults. Yeah, and she went on furthermore to see, I wanna see the necessity for this wiped out. I think that was a quote. Like, like she thinks it's pathetic that she's still gotta do this, you know? So I think, yeah, the, the necessity, it would be nice if that wasn't the case, but it's not. Teachers are prejudiced. They, police officers are prejudiced. We're prejudiced. You know, we have not just eliminated the need or the necessity for that type of thing. So if it's necessary, you know, let's do it. Um, minority group members underrepresented in education, who's the message coming from? Fewer than 6% on uh, the college level are African-American, 4% are Hispanic, yet uh, they make about 13 or 11% of students. We know that there's prejudice in teachers, staffs, particularly mostly white staffs. Um, and of course that personal prejudice can offset any of the positive impacts that I'm talking about of these educational programs or opportunities. Um, important that minorities are represented on staffs and teaching intergroup relations, yes. Um, obviously, like the main, <laughs> the main point about this is it really, people of European descent need to learn how to listen to people of color. I said that last week too. This is my job. I'm going to teach you this stuff. Yes, I am about as translucent as it gets. That being said, I have done so many trainings where I have been listening to powerful women, powerful women of color, powerful men of color, powerful um, outside those binary gender construct, powerful people of color, and it is important. So how can we get more of these staffs? 
How can we get, you know, in colleges, um, more people tenured, more people that are uh, diverse at the heads of Fortune 500 companies? Um, how, does, how does that happen? Because we cannot always do this message coming from white people for white people or people of European descent. Okay. Um, wow, that's a lot. And we just went through it. I'm going to finish up next time. Any questions about any of this that we're talking? Has anybody here ever got a few minutes tried to dismantle racism or prejudice? Did you march? Did you protest? Did you sit quietly and peaceful and meditate? Did you challenge someone, a family member? Um, did anybody go look up that TikTok thing with the uh, people challenging their families on race? I don't know why you would anyway. Why, why am I even saying the words TikTok? But still, there was some interesting stuff there. So, But it's an example of young people, 10, 12, 13, 14 years old, trying to dismantle prejudice. Um, has anybody here ever done something like that? Um, I don't know if this counts or not, um, but I have friends that have different views than I do. And so I kind of like, I guess, fight my own prejudice by just having like conversations with them about like why they see it this way. And like, just, I don't know if that's fighting prejudice or if it's just educating yourself. Yeah, I guess fighting is a, is not, is a poor choice of words and a violent word choice. Dismantle, educate about, you know, I mean, it could be, it could be literally, you know, fighting against racism or whatever, but yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's, look, people do that. <laughs> they sit and they talk about differing opinions and they try to educate each other as friends. Not all friends think exactly the same. And so there's opportunities there because you're already friends, right? It, it's that piece. Um, good. Anybody else? What? When I marched into my, in my town, someone tried to run us over multiple times and tried to drive into the crowd. A bunch of adults spat as they drove by and cursed at us. Wow. Pathetic. That's all I'll say. Um, I think some state, see, it's so, it's so interesting. Instead of facing racism and deciding to get new voters, just a certain particular bunch of states, which is no coincidence, just trying to rewrite the ability for people to vote and people who have less money and people who have color. Um, you know, instead of spitting on people and trying to run them over, and then one of these states recently, I think, tried to make it a law that it's okay to do that. Somebody look it up. Yeah. I just read this within the last, I feel like month. Like it might not be a felony to ram into people who think differently than you. I don't know and try and kill them with your car. So yeah, um, but you know, I would stand out there and march, I don't know, or, or just stand there peacefully and protest uh, like against uh, the Gulf War or just, you know, downtown people used to be on that side. And it was like, there was one side that was sort of anti-war and the other side was patriots, I guess. I have no idea, but people would yell and spit and they'd say things like, get a job. And it was a Saturday and you're like, it's a Saturday, I have a job. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of, yeah, I think, um, I think marching and showing that, I mean, just from just just from listening to the, the basketball announcers that were using the N-word and, and berating like high school, female high school athletes uh, a few weeks back, caught on a hot mic, repeating it. Um, yeah, you know, again, awful. But uh, the bill you were talking about was proposed in Tennessee, gave immunity to the drivers. I'm not making this up, folks. So again, Instead of trying to make laws where you can run people over that disagree with you, why not try and figure out why you're disagreeing? You know, instead of laws to keep people of color from voting and you can't even give people water in lines, like that's why you're hearing the word Jim Crow used so much over the last week. Cause you've crossed way from like voting things into like humanitarian things. That's why, um, because we've gone past that. And then somebody would say, yeah, but this bill gives the chance to vote polling places open up from 7 a.m. to 7, not just till 5. Well, it doesn't expand voting. It's an option that people won't take advantage of because they've already like cut, <laughs> meant to cut down, use this to cut down in the amount of hours that people can vote. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, good. Anybody else here uh, marching 
That's good. Anybody take place in a peaceful protest of, of any sort or uh, addressed a family member in any way? It doesn't, you don't have to tell me the conversation, obviously, but. Well, uh, I guess we're over time anyway. We've got one more day and the rest of the semester. Um, so we will uh, resume next time. Uh, please be good people, do good things, mask up, be safe. Uh, thank you, Jared Polis, for extending the mask mandate for another month so that people can get vaccinations and people can still go into grocery stores and feel safe, uh, like Julie, who, who is, you know, um, out there stocking your food and a lot of other good people so that you can eat. So uh, do those things that are really easy to keep people safe. Thank you so much for being compassionate and understanding during um this chapter and really all of these chapters and next time um i'll let you ask questions and maybe there's people in this class that can answer them for us even better than me I, as i am sure that there are because my students always have so many experiences that i've never had all right uh take care folks i'll see you in just a couple of days peace thank you thank you and i'll go make sure the chickens are all good <laughs>